What we want to do over the next hour or so is, is increase awareness of these diseases, what we need to do uh, when outbreaks occur, like the Peruvian outbreak currently, but also what we want to do in terms of how we can help at this end, how we parliamentarians can help influence our government to help, uh, and what measures we might need to start taking to um, reduce or prevent infection uh, coming here. Because they're vector transmitted, uh, climate change is relevant, very relevant to these infections. Um, the vector distribution undoubtedly will be influenced uh, by climate change. Um, and so that's one of the real concerns uh, we have. It's a pleasure. I'll <laughs> If I, I can welcome the High Commissioner. Would you like to say a few words now, Catherine? Or, uh, yeah. Um, so uh, we're going to be considering this with, a, with an excellent panel of speakers. We're very lucky initially to have a, a remotely joining us is Dr. Soche Fall, who is head of Global Neglected Trouble Disease at WHO. He was the host for the two-day meeting I've just referred to, and I hope we maybe get him on very soon, Marianne, yes? And thank you so much for joining this meeting and, and saying a few words at the beginning of the meeting. I've just introduced the topic briefly, and you've had a very exhausting two days. Uh, I referred to the meeting at Geneva, but it's a pleasure to welcome you, and, and please do say a few words uh, of greeting for our APPG uh, members today. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen and colleagues and friends, it's a real pleasure to, to join you today. And thank you, Lord T, for coming to Geneva for our two days meeting. It was really important for the global program to have everybody on board for a new start, a new movement on NTDs. And I'm very glad to join you today to talk about the Global Amber Virus Initiative a joint program between WHO Health Emergency Program, a joint initiative, I mean, between WHO Health Emergency Program and the NTD and immunization program to prevent mosquito-borne viral epidemic and pandemic events. Uh, you can see in this map that uh, there are so many countries reporting Iodes bone diseases and dengue is the most widespread with 130 countries reporting cases. You can see from the blue color, you know, we have countries which are reporting three or more viruses in circulation. And the green indicates the presence of two diseases, at least why other colors refer to one of the four Iodes bone viruses that are of greater concern. As you can see, the majority of the world has poor circulation of diseases. As many as they share the same vector and drivers of transmission, and an integrated initiative to tackle transmission is a paramount. It's really important to see that countries are facing multiple risks in many continents, and the risk to have a pandemic-like event is even bigger. We will remember 2016, 2017, a big, you know, fever outbreak in Angola, the Congo, spreading to China, and the same time, you know, fever outbreak happening in Brazil and other part of South America. So during the last decade, we also have chikungunya emerging and spreading across Americas, Asia, as well as in many African countries. Also, in some countries, the capacity to detect is still very low. But in 20 15, the world, the world was really struck by the Zika emergence in the Pacific Islands and subsequently in Brazil before spreading rapidly across the region and leading to the public health emergency of international concern, as we remember. And by 2019, when the Arab Virus Initiative was identified as the cross cutting activity for WHO, the world was facing several dengue outbreaks in many countries and in many continents. And we have reached the highest rate of 
you know, then get transmission across continent. And the COVID-19 pandemic has also exposed and amplified, amplified our vulnerability to emerging infectious diseases like chikungunya, Zika, yellow fever, and dengue. And uh, these viruses have made significant inroads in the population and region during the acute phase of the COVID-19 pandemic because of the disruption of so many interventions. So it was very important you know, to adopt an integrated approach to combine the critical component of disease detection, prevention, and control. And this includes entomological and morbidity surveillance, laboratory capacity, clinical management, vector control, and community engagement. And WHO is in a unique position to raise the global alarm regarding the risk of agrovirus epidemic and potential pandemic. Our impact will be stronger if we work together. We have a global alert and verification system, but we need to make sure that when we are able to detect those signals and confirm them, we come together as you know, a, glo a global partner to, to, to control the events. So the Arboviruses Initiative is situated formally within the One Health approach and address all aspects of high tech pathogen from you know, the alert, the pandemic prevention, preparedness, detection, and response. And as you just highlighted, Lord three, the climate change requires our attention to uh, increase in global temperature and changing pattern of uh, precipitation and bring up a virus diseases to new, previously unaffected areas or to reintroduce the diseases where they have been eliminated. We are already seeing, you know, increased frequency of arboviruses viruses diseases in some part of Europe, but also in so many countries in the world. And I'm pleased to say, however, that integration is already happening from outside because the Global Arboviruses Initiative sits under the umbrella of the WHO triple billion target and complements the elimination of yellow fever epidemic strategy we developed in 2017-2018 as well as the Global Vector Control Response Initiative. Um, also, I'm pleased to say a major component of my own programs, the Global NTD program, because I want to make sure that we work across program, starting from the risk, the capacity we need to detect, to respond, and a well-coordinated global approach. So WHO is uniquely positioned globally to raise our alarm, as I said earlier, but we want to make sure that we work in a perfect coordination with partners, not only at global level, but at regional and national level to convert partners and coordinate this initiative. Because as we always say, there is no global without local. We need to make sure that everything we say in this initiative can be applied at the local level with a very decentralized system. So for the Global Arboviruses Initiative, now, just building existing disease-specific program, not only integrating the diseases, but also integrating the critical components that I outlined, just outlined before. So we have six main pillars in this initiative. Um, the pillar one consists of monitoring and anticipating the threat by means of global risk monitoring tool and by modeling potential epidemic and pandemic scenario for arboviruses using collaborative intelligence for you know so many sector environment animal health you know and human health and others monitoring airborne disease is currently based on information about mosquito presence and population density however we do not have a global tool that allows for real-time monitoring of risk and for early detection of arboviruses transmission via multiple partners and at local and global level. So we need to work strongly on that. The pillar two is mainly on the relation epidemic risk um, seek to strengthen early detection, increase capacity for field investigation, and improve the response to arboviruses outbreak. This also includes increasing population protection against yellow fever through the elimination of the air strategy. Since we started the air strategy in 2018, we have been able to vaccinate more than 400 million people and protect it against yellow fever. So the most effective way to improve early detection and response is to support countries' capacity for preparedness, early detection, laboratory confirmation, and immediate epidemiological investigation, 
This is a key priority for the global hand of viruses. For yellow fever, for example, in 2018, we only have one reference laboratory in the African region because HD passed the car. And now we have four or five reference centers to confirm the yellow fever outbreak. And we continue to increase. And the third pillar focus on vector control, so enhanced environmental and vector surveillance, something across sector, and increasing preparedness in urban setting and densely populated area. We all know now with you know vector borne diseases, the risk and vulnerability in some of the city has increased because of you know the unplanned urbanization, the density of the population, and so many other social factors that really lead to increase the density of the mosquito population. And the fourth pillar also is about global coordination, global surveillance mechanism for rapid response. And uh, it's really important for WHO short as we build capacity for countries and partners to be able to implement everything we said at local level. This is the fifth pillar on innovation and new approaches. We have been talking about research and development during our last two days meeting, but we want to make sure that using our existing system like the RNB blueprint for epidemic, we can work end to end process from research and development, production, you know, supply and utilization at country level. Um, and the sixth pillar in the next slide. Um, and the final one of the Global Algo Virus Initiative build on coalition, partnership, and perhaps the most important point because we have so many components, so many pillars that needs various organizations, various institutions, all working together in a coordinated manner to with the countries, with the national and local level. That's why this meeting is extremely important and we need the coalition to ensure effective implementation where needed. And, uh, we need to strengthen and coordinate existing partnerships, and we need to invite, encourage, and build new ones because we cannot only rely on our old relationship, old system. We need to make sure that we are inclusive and we address the complexity together. The task we have at hand is to mobilize global and local resources, to stimulate investment, and to catalyze action. So a much central global partnership and a forum of stakeholders committed to tackling Iris bone diseases and the widespread epidemic threat they pose is the key success. Once our engagement includes governments, the private sector, academia, international organizations, we can develop a native communication platform that will ensure the timely dissemination of relevant information to multiple audiences across the globe. And I hope that um, I've given you an overview a very brief and quick overview of the key element of the initiative to just reassure you that for us, this is a platform for collaboration. And we are very happy to be able to talk to you today. And I can ensure you that I, along with my entire team, remain at your disposition to answer any question and to, most importantly, continue working with you to make this initiative a reality at country level. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sosha. I don't know, are you able to stay with the meeting or do you have to dash off? This is fine, I can stay. You can, you can stay? Yes. Uh, in that case, maybe we hold questions till, till the end uh, and uh, then the whole panel can respond to the questions if that's all right. But thank you so much, Dr. Soche. I know you're extremely busy, uh, but that was a very valuable uh, overview of the current uh, situation. So it's uh, a pleasure now to introduce uh, Dr. Dinu Gurugu. Uh, from Sri Lanka, who is a consultant with the Dengue Global Programme at the Drugs for Neglected Disease Initiative uh, and regional epidemiologist in the city of Colombo. Um, and she's worked for the Minister of Health in Sri Lanka for 10 years or more, I think. Uh, and so you're going to tell us about the risks associated with the spread of dengue and the experiences in Sri Lanka. Over to you. Thank you, Lord Trees. Oh, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so 
Uh, as Lord Trees rightfully said, dengue is the most widely and rapidly spreading mosquito-borne viral disease in the world. And as recent, uh, fueled by climate change, rapid urbanization, population growth, evolution of the virus has taken a new turn. And the, with the evolution emerges new variants and serotypes of dengue, and which uh, in turn has led to massive outbreaks in countries like mine in Sri Lanka. So um, uh, with a 30-fold increase in global incidence over the past 50 years, more than half of the world's population is at risk of dengue infection now, and is predicted to increase about 60% of the world population by 2080. Each year, an estimated 390 million infections occur around the world, resulting up to 36,000 deaths. So as the regional epidemiologist of the city of Colombo, uh, I'd like to share a bit of my experience that I had during my tenure uh, in Sri Lanka in Colombo. Um, so this is the city of Colombo. It's a highly dense, uh, highly populous, population dense city. And we have been battling with dengue for the past 15 to 20 years. Uh, the city has a special task force dedicated to plan outbreak control and seasonal clustering, but our numbers remain the same or is increasing as we speak. Uh, Dengue has a seasonal transmission in Sri Lanka and with two peaks occurring with the monsoon rains in June and July and October and December, respectively. The majority of cases occur in June, July and the summer monsoon for the past decade. And 2017, as you can see, was, was critical for us. Our healthcare system was overburdened. Our hospital beds were filled. Our children were sick and our pregnant ladies were also having, diag having diagnosed with dengue. So um, the city of Colombo contributes to the national dengue statistics with an incidence of 299 persons per 100,000 populations, while in the whole island, the incidence fluctuates about 190 per 100,000 population. That is quite a large amount. And as hard as we try to handle this outbreak with national strategic plans for dengue, the currently available public health measures and community engagements cannot make much uh, effect of the numbers that, ca that the cases are being reported. Um, Sri Lanka has stepped up by establishing a special dengue control uh, unit and uh, a presidential task force. But, the, uh, but there has been great progress in disease surveillance, clinical management, and vector control. National guidelines with enhanced uh, available diagnostics have significantly improved the clinical management of dengue at the rate, but reducing the case fatality rate about to 0.2%, which is a record low in the, in the Southeast Asia. However, sustaining this momentum is a challenge. As you can see in this slide, even with COVID in 2019 and 2020, we had some reported cases, but we as Colombo Municipal Council, where the dengue is always controlled, our annual health budget in the whole city of Colombo spends 25% of its money on dengue and its surveillancing. And as you can see, the Dengue hemorrhagic fever increases maternal death by 450%, and it was the first cause for maternal deaths in 2017 we had, when we had the outbreak. And it also includes fetal complications, stillbirth, preterm delivery, and fetal distress and miscarriages, which we all, all have as a consequence of high incidence of dengue. And the changing epidemiology has not been helping Sri Lanka either, because at this moment of time, we're experiencing nearly 300 cases per 100,000 population as we speak of today. So the importance of an integrated approach is, is really important right now. And as, as, as a country who has been battling with dengue for the last 10 to 15 years, we know our ways of clinical improvement, but vector surveillance and community engagement is not enough as yet so far. We direly need a treatment solution. We direly need a proper diagnostic method in order to find out and treat dengue patients. Here you can see uh, in 2017 how our hospital setup was surged with dengue patients. Our problem is who to treat, who to treat, who to develop, who, who will develop serious complications and how to treat, how to prevent serious illness. It's always a problem when it comes to dengue and it's overwhelming our healthcare systems. The overwhelming numbers of admissions and the severe burden to the healthcare system that the world saw in COVID-19 is faced by dengue endemic countries 
on seasonal basis. And the fact that dengue being restricted to the tropics and the subtropic is not actual anymore. Uh, dengue pathogens often move with people and with result of climate change and rapid urbanization and population growth, the migration of dengue has expanded it, its horizons and is, is going to reach and will be a world problem soon. Uh, innovation for climate change sensitive diseases such as dengue should be a collective effort and no single country or an organization can address multiple aspects of discovering, developing and ensuring access to new healthcare tools for climate sensitive diseases. Collaborative approaches with endemic countries and in the lead to ensure the development of new health care tools from bench to bedside is quintessential. So that's where the Dengue Alliance in, comes, uh, DNDI, the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative, along with the key partners have established Dengue Alliance to work on joint projects to progress preclinical investigations for potential dengue treatments. The Dengue Alliance members coordinate efforts to help overcome knowledge gaps and expedite clinical research and regulatory approvals, including addressing unmet needs for diagnostics. The partnership also focuses on raising funds and mobilizing resources while openly sharing research knowledge. The partners of this alliance are the Transitional Health Sciences Institute in India, Ministry of Health in Malaysia, the Sri Raj Hospital Faculty of Medicine in Mahidol University, Thailand, and the Oswaldo Cruz Foundation, Fio Cruz, and UFMG in Brazil. The partners of this alliance uh, uh, work day to day to order to deliver treatment, and the Dengue Alliance is initially embarking on finding suitable antiviral drugs and host detected treatment by repurposing drugs, uh, and the work is progressing well so far. So the dengue strategy is what Sri Lanka needed, and I think the rest of the world who is battling with dengue is to identify, correctly identify the patients with dengue. So we need proper diagnosis and identify who need it most. So to risk stratify, because at the moment of time, we have so many patients who might develop serious dengue complications, who might not. And we have no way of knowing who, would, who that would be without a proper biomarker to predict it. And to treat and prevent progression of severe disease, we need effective drugs. And that is, the dengue, but that is what the Dengue Alliance is actually working right now. So to wrap up, a research and development for dengue treatment and diagnosis should be included in infectious diseases funding and policy priorities. Availability and equitable access to tools to diagnose and treat cli climate sensitive diseases are a key part in building resilient communities and health systems. Biopharmaceutical innovation for vaccines, diagnostics and treatments thus needs to be a core part of climate change adaptation strategy. The UK Global Health Framework brings together Together, priorities for research and development, climate adaptation, and ending preventable death. The UK government should make the links between them and prioritize research and development for climate sensitive diseases such as dengue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Garuga. So make a note of your questions and, and we'll take them at the end. Uh, it's a pleasure now to introduce Dr. Theodore Sai, uh, from, uh, who was uh, Vice President for Immunization Science and Policy at the Global Medical Office of Takeda Vaccines. He's going to talk about specifically dengue in, in some of the less and some of the lesser known epidemiology. Uh, it's an honor and privilege to address this distinguished group. Uh, <clears throat> dengue, as you've heard, is the fastest growing vector borne disease globally. But I'll focus this talk on the risks to Europe and to the UK. Uh, these are my opinions and don't necessarily reflect those of the company. I'll set the stage by describing aspects of dengue's epidemiology and bionomics of its vectors. And we'll focus on Aedes albopictus because that species is the dengue vector most relevant to the UK at the moment. I'll conclude by describing newly understood risk factors for severe dengue. There are four distinct dengue viruses, dengue one through four, all transmitted from person to person via the agency of Aedes aegypti, the principal vector. And as you'll hear later, Aedes albopictus, an important secondary vector. The virus also is viable in desiccated, vertically infected eggs. Now, dengue is one of four diseases transmitted anthroponotically, that is from person to person, by Aedes aegypti. 
yellow fever is not shown in the, in the figure to the right because its clinical dis, um, presentation differs from dengue and the other two, chikungunya and Zika virus infections. Now, these infections typically are self-limited febrile illnesses characterized by rash, musculoskeletal pain, headache, and other nonspecific symptoms. Clinically, the infections may be indistinguishable from each other and more generally from other viral infections. Dengue can be severe, however, in second infections due to an immunopathologic host response due to incomplete cross protection after infection with another of the four viruses. Importantly, in experienced centers, the case fatality rate for dengue is less than 0.1%, but where dengue is not familiar to clinicians, it can be as high as 15%, underscoring the clinical complexity of dengue diagnosis and its clinical management. Now, Aedes aegypti, aegypti is a highly effective vector of dengue uh, virus because it evolved from its sylvatic tree hole breeding sibling Aedes aegyptus formosus to one adapted to humans in the human built environment about 5,000 years ago at the end of the humid epoch in Africa. Aedes aegypti aegypti evolved to use water storage containers to ovoposit and becoming endophilic, that is dwelling indoors and endophagic, that is feeding indoors. And most importantly, in becoming a specialist in feeding almost exclusively on humans. As a commensal, as a commensal, Aedes aegypti uh, is the principal agent for dengue transmission in the tropics and can vector explosive outbreaks, as you've heard recently in Peru. Aedes albopictus, on the other hand, feeds opportunistically on a range of vertebrates, dogs, cats, squirrels, whatever is available. And from the perspective of viral transmission, that means that those blood meals are dead ends. So Aedes albopictus is adapted to forests and its ecotones with rural locations. So in human settlements, it's found in the garden, whereas Aedes aegypti is indoors. <laughs> so Aedes uh, aegypti is limited to the tropics and subtropics, the upper figure, where temperatures are no colder than about 15 degrees centigrade. Aedes albopictus is adapted to more temperate conditions and has spread from its Asian origins to become cosmopolitan, including continental Europe and the UK. The major differences in the respective ranges of the species are in North America, Europe, East Asia in particular, and Australia. Now these maps from the European CDC showed the distribution of various 80s, invasive 80 species. In the upper right is the distribution of 80s aegypti, which is, you see is, is uh, confined to a delimited area along the Black Sea. And the little panel on the left, Madeira Island. While in the upper right, you see 80s albopictus is established across a broad expanse of Europe. And then below, other in, a, invasive 80 species also potentially could transmit dengue, Aedes japonicus, and more likely Aedes coriacus. Both have become established in Europe. It's noteworthy that Aedes aegypti had been present in Europe, but was eliminated after World War II. But on the right, its future distribution is projected to expand significant, significantly beyond its historical bounds with warming global temperatures, including a possibility for establishment in the UK. As was noted previously, the current documented distribution of Aedes albopictus on the left is more extensive than Aedes aegypti, but on the right, it's modeled distribution based on environmental suitability shows that its actual range is likely to be broader, including much of the UK. And looking to the future, within a generation, the range of Aedes albopictus is projected to be greater yet, including areas around a number of UK cities, which I've circled on the right. Now I described Aedes albopictus as a secondary dengue vector, but outbreaks and endemic transmission in locations where aegypti is absent demonstrates its vectorial capacity. I'll provide two examples. In China, large outbreaks of autochthonous dengue, indigenously acquired dengue, occur almost yearly, shown in the red curve on the upper left. The locations of these cases, shown in blue, the bottom uh, left, occupies an area far larger 
than the distribution of Aedes aegypti shown in orange at the upper right. What you see is a zoomed in map and the distribution of Aedes aegypti is limited to a small coastal area of Southern China and to Hainan Island. In contrast, Aedes albopictus represented in green on the lower, on the lower right occurs almost everywhere in the most populated areas of China, and therefore dengue control is focused on that species. Now, Japan had experienced extensive Aedes alpopictus vector dengue outbreaks immediately after World War II, but no autochthonous cases have occurred in recent decades. Thus, an outbreak in the middle of Tokyo in 2014 was remarkable. It illustrates the transmission potential for dengue even in the heart of a modern, mostly paved over city. 160 cases were li linked to visitation to a park where international festivals were hosted early in the summer. It's believed that Aedes albopictus, and you, you see on the upper right, the positive trap sites in Yoyogi Park, uh, that uh, uh, the uh, local Aedes albopictus acquired infection from viremic festival attendees setting off transmission to park visitors for several weeks afterwards, many of whom carried infection to other points in the city, shown at the lower upper, uh, excuse me, lower right and beyond Tokyo. Now this map shows the park's location with respect to perhaps familiar landmarks and also illustrates its size and the relative scarcity of vegetated areas in this mega city. Now, this brings us to Europe, where the public health impact of dengue is mostly among travelers. Acquiring dengue infection is remarkably frequent among travelers to areas where the disease is endemic, up to 6.8% in these various studies. A recent HSA study of samples submitted for diagnosis of ill-returning travelers to the UK found that among the more than 53,000 cases, dengue was the most frequent diagnosis. <laughs> The broader concern, however, for imported dengue is its possible spread and amplification by local Aedes albopictus. Between 2015 and 2019, European CDC reported 1,418 dengue cases returning to locations where Aedes albopictus was present. Fortunately, very few small clusters of local transmission resulted mostly in Southern France, but Events in 2022 were remarkable, first, for the number of local outbreaks, nine in different locations in France, and the number of cases, 67, more than all of the other cases uh, in previous years combined. So the growing transmission of dengue in endemic locations themselves, growth of global travel, and increasing range and prevalence of Aedes albopictus in Europe contribute to a growing risk for local transmission and signals the need for improved surveillance and vector control capacity. I'll switch gears now and we'll highlight briefly some risk factors for de den severe dengue that may not be widely appreciated, but are points that I believe are relevant to a discussion of travelers. Now this figure condenses results from an Imperial College meta-analysis of risk factors for severe dengue. The analysis was particularly valuable because the authors stratified results by age group. For decades, dengue principally was a disease of children, but as you've heard, due to demographic shifts, dengue increasingly is a disease of adults and older adults. Now in children, secondary infections pose a significant risk for severe disease with a relative risk of 2.78 in this meta-analysis. In adults, Secondary infections also increase risk for severe outcomes, but with a lower relative risk of 1.5 that was overshadowed by higher risks associated with a number of underlying conditions, diabetes and chronic heart and kidney disease. Now this shows that in adults, comorbidities are a more significant risk factor for severe dengue than the immunopathologically driven antibody enhanced disease, ADE, in secondary infection. Now we examine these two risk factors, age and underlying disease, in a study of a national database um, in Taiwan, encompassing more than 50,000 laboratory confirmed dengue cases. We showed that chronic disease independently contributed to increased risks for hospitalization, ICU admission, which is a proxy for severity and mortality due to dengue. We examined a broad range of chronic diseases and at the right for mortality, you see the malignancy, 
diabetes, congestive heart failure, COPD, asthma, rheumatoid arthritis, chronic renal disease, and cirrhosis confers significantly elevated risks for dying from dengue. We also showed that advancing age independently was a risk factor for severe outcomes. Rates for dengue deaths rose with advancing, advanced age and was more than 100-fold higher in the oldest adults compared to 19 to 45-year-olds. The pattern of rising risk in older adults for dengue hospitalization, ICU admission, and death parallels what's seen for other acute infectious diseases, including influenza and COVID. Now, here are observations from southern Brazil showing on the left excess influ influenza mortality by age, and on the right, rates for dengue deaths by age, with older adults dying at 50 to 100-fold higher rates than their younger counterparts. The histograms are virtually superimposable, but note, importantly, the different scales of the y-axis. Dengue mortality was almost 100-fold lower than for influenza. Now, this last slide is a reminder that COVID mortality also increases astronomically with advanced age. In this summary of the US experience over the entire pandemic, deaths in the oldest age group were 360 fold higher than in young adults. There's thus a commonality among dengue, influenza, COVID, and also respiratory syncytial virus, another respiratory infection for which vaccines recently have been approved for older adults that they are at higher risk for severe and fatal outcomes than the rest of the population. So in areas at risk for, uh, areas at risk for dengue will expand with the growing ranges of Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus, including within Europe. Although Aedes albopictus is considered a secondary vector of dengue, it can be the sole species associated with endemic and epidemic transmission. Other AD species also pose a hypothetical risk in Europe. Finally, severe dengue is not limited to second uh, antibody enhanced infections, but also is associated with advanced age and with the presence of chronic disease. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sai. with um a rather disturbing presentation and a worrying one, given what we've gone through with COVID, which also has a low case fatality rate. But when you get hundreds of thousands of people involved in particular high risk groups, uh, can lead to substantial excess deaths. Uh, thank you very much. Very detailed, very uh, thorough. Um, next, can I introduce Dr. Juan Carlos Jaramillo, who uh, is Chief Medical Officer at Valneva, uh, you might want to introduce Valneva to us, perhaps, uh, Juan Carlos. Uh, and you're going to focus on chikungunya, the global spread and factors uh, in, involved in that, including global warming. Over to you. Perfect. Thank you. Can you hear me? Perfect. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today and share a bit about chikungunya and the growing burden of disease uh, related to arbovirus. So let me start off first by mentioning that chikungunya virus or chick V is a serious and debilitating uh, mosquito-borne viral infection that poses a significant unmet need globally. Chick V is transmitted to humans by mosquitoes belonging to the Aedes genus type. We have Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus. Mosquitoes that are primary vectors responsible for the transmission. Chick V infections are associated with acute and a chronic illness that causes substantial morbidity among infected individuals. A very high percentage of infected individuals become symptomatic. It is estimated that up to 97% of individuals infected suffer from acute symptoms. These include sudden onsets of high fever, and oftentimes severe joint pain with swelling that usually begins between three to seven days and can last for many years. Many patients experience debilitating long-term consequences of infection. With approximately 43% of these patients that are infected will suffer from chronic chip V and experience symptoms lasting months to years after initial infection. 
There has been one retrospective analysis published last year. It reported that up to 57% of patients are still affected by the disease after two and a half years. Another study reported that 79% of individuals have persistent muscle and joint symptoms more than two years after the infection. We also see that in rare instances, these infections are associated with neurological symptoms such as altered mental status, seizures, and motor and sensory issues. Severe infections can also affect the heart, resulting in heart failure and arrhythmias. Chikungunya has meanwhile spread globally and it is currently regarded as one of the most likely viral infections to emerge in new geographic areas due to its explosive and rapidly moving, but not predictable epidemics. An issue which raises an urgent need for efficient prophylaxis as no approved vaccine or antiviral therapies to protect against chikungunya virus infections and to defend against outbreaks exist. Chikungunya virus has been identified in more than 100 countries across five continents. Chikungunya was first described in Tanzania in 1952. The word chikungunya means that which bends up. This is in reference of the stoop posture of patients affected by the severe joint pains. A mutation during a 2005 and 2006 outbreak showed that the virus enhances transmission, allowing for its spread from tropical to temperate regions, including Europe. Since then, these mosquitoes have rapidly spread the disease in more temperate climates where it has not previously been a problem. Today, it is estimated that more than 75% of the world's population lives in areas at risk for Chick V infections. These outbreaks highly highlight the risk of import, importation of virus into new geographic areas and the explosive nature of the outbreaks that occur as a result. Most concerning is that modeling now shows the problem may only get worse due to global warming and climate change. As the Earth's temperature continues to rise, we are likely to see vector habitats expand, which pose an immediate risk of outbreaks in warmer areas in Europe. As shown on the map, you can see the current distribution of the Aedes albopictus, with the country shaded in red representing an established presence of the mosquito. Yellow show an introduction of the mosquito and green where the population of the mosquitoes is currently absent. A notable event was the rapid spread of the virus in Italy by a single infected traveler from India in 2007. More than 160 cases were virologically confirmed in two neighboring villages and zero prevalence studies estimated that approximately 10% of the inhabitants in these communities were infected during this massive outbreak. These outbreaks highlight the risk of importation of virus into new geographic areas, as I mentioned before, and the explosive nature of the outbreaks that occur as a result. The ECDC stated the likelihood of introduction of the virus to continental Europe, European countries through a viremic travelers returning from an endemic subtropical and tropical countries is high. To summarize, since its reemergence, Chick V has spread throughout the world, affecting millions of people as seen from the latest outbreak that occurred earlier this year in Paraguay, with approximately 138,000 cases and around four, 114 deaths confirmed to date. Chick V is a major threat to global public health due to its ability to cause large, explosive, and unpredictable outbreaks that affect up to 75% of the world's population. Chikungunya disease is very relevant to UK as a global travel hub with strong ties to Asia, Africa, and West Indies. With the increase in travel to, from, and within Europe, the chikungunya virus poses a public health threat in the region specifically if co-infections occur with other vector-borne diseases such as dengue virus. If there's one thing that I've learned studying and tracking vector-borne diseases, it's that we should not try to predict them. 
but we rather prepare for them because it only takes one infected individual to establish disease transmission among our local mosquito population. And once established, as we've seen in other countries around the world, the spread of the disease can be hard to stop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Juan Carlos, for adding to my depression. <laughs> um, serious prospects ahead. I'd now like to just hand over to my co-chair of the APPG, Catherine West MP, to introduce the High Commissioner. Thank you, Lord Trees. I'm assuming that Richard Allen is not here with us. Correct. Right. Yes. On your program, you might have had the CEO of Mentor Initiative, who's not able to join us. Welcome to... Uh, our group, and I wanted briefly to welcome as well Varendra Sharma, the MP for Ealing, who had to shoot off, as did Florence Nazegbi, who's had to charge off as well. Um, you might have heard there's some by-elections, <laughs> and that means we have to go and work them, um, being on this side of the house, whereas Lord Trees, I'm sure, will be able to manage um, the, the program for the neglected tropical diseases as we go forward in the coming months. Um, I'd, we'd also really love to um, just put on record my thanks for my friend Des Brown, who is here from the House of Lords, and are there any peers who I've missed who might be here in a, with a different hat on? There often is because of the expertise. Sandy, I don't think I've missed anyone, have I? Just Lord Brown. Lord Oates was here earlier, who's a Lib Dem peer. Thank you very much. Um, and if you're interested in the um, program that we offer in our group, please um, be in touch with Martha, who is our wonderful coordinator sitting over there in the corner, and watch out for our website because we do try and make it interesting. Um, and today has been absolutely fascinating. With no further ado, I would like to introduce um, uh, an excellent colleague who's in the House on a regular basis, who I know through my shadow role as the Shadow Minister for the Indo Pacific, um, Madam Sidisena, who um, is a very very active participant here in the House of Commons on, a very, on various different missions, but today it's the Global Health Challenge and the Climate Change Challenge. So with no further ado, I would like to hand over to you, Saroja, for your, your thoughts today. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine, for that kind introduction. Thought trees, um, shadow for a minister. Uh, thank you, panelists and ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for inviting me to address you. I'm a little bit daunted because I am not by any means an expert on, on, on uh, malaria or the neglected tropical diseases. Um, but I am pleased to be here to share a little bit about Sri Lanka's experience and what we do as a country to mitigate uh, some of these challenges. I'm happy to note that uh, my compatriot, Dr. Dinu Guruge, uh, is also here. Um, and also wish to congratulate you on the ISNDT virtual um, event that was organized last month on Dengue, a Sri Lanka in focus, which um, involved a number of experts from Sri Lanka as well. Sri Lanka is perhaps, I don't know whether everyone knows, but it's renowned for its free health policy, which was adopted in 1950. The basic infrastructure of health institutions, the state trained midwives for villages and trained nurses was established as early as 1927. Our life, life expectancy, maternal and infant mortality rates are higher than those of countries with comparable economies and even on par with those of the developed world. The prevalence of arboviral diseases such as dengue is common in Sri Lanka, as you all heard. And uh, we've had a multi-stakeholder inclusive approach through the highest levels of governance for dengue prevention and control. The government has put in place a strategy for dengue prevention and control under six pillars which is monitoring the disease, surveillance, vector surveillance, integrated vector management, capacity building, resource allocation for evidence-based clinical care, intersectoral coordination, and social mobilization, 
risk communication and outbreak preparedness and response and research, of course. The National Dengue Control Unit is the focal point for the program under the Ministry of Health, which was established in the year 2005. Um, following the first um, major outbreak in 2004. Its responsibilities are, among others, the control of and prevention of dengue and coordinating with different stakeholders. Recently, President Vikramasinghe has directed to establish a ministerial committee and an expert committee on curtailing COVID-19 and dengue. And the committee is led by the Prime Minister uh, with cabinet ministers and state ministers with the primary responsibility of to Im implement urgent measures aimed at controlling the spread of COVID-19 and dengue. The expert committee has 11 members who possess knowledge in these fields. The committee is chaired by also another medical professional, British trained, uh, may I add, uh, state Sri Lankan and British trained, the state minister for health. Um, and I think at this point, I'd like to add that the collaboration of the establishment of Sri Lanka's health sector pre-independence and continuing where Sri Lanka has been sending, it is actually, the, I learned from the Royal College of Physicians that Sri Lanka is that country that sends the highest number of postgrad trainees under the medical training initiative where the government actually spends on um, doctors, Sri Lankan trained medical professionals to obtain British um, certification. And we have, I think, a return rate of about, conservatively speaking, 50% now, but we still do it because it's important to us. These collaborations are what actually keep, sustain our good healthcare system. So we're pleased to share those medical professionals with the United Kingdom. So these committees, as I said, to fight COVID-19 and dengue have been spread across nine provincial uh, areas and the involvement of the subcommittees is to enhance collaboration, coordination at the provincial level and uh, to fight these diseases. At the provincial district, really regional and village dengue prevention control committees, are community-based organizations island-wide to carry out grassroots level dengue prevention campaigns for social mobilizations. And again, I'll bring back, come back to the Sri Lankan healthcare sector where we have, for maternal healthcare, we have this midwife system, which has been quite successful in increasing awareness amongst village populations, especially if people don't have access to hospitals immediately. So there is someone monitoring the progress of maternal health care. So this is done in a situation where people are aware of their health care related concerns and rights. So I think the grassroots level, what we've done is quite, quite good for a developing country. So the island-wide special mosquito control campaigns are also carried out prior to the onset of monsoons, ideally, uh, but in collaboration with other, like the military, the police, uh, the CBOs, vital sectors such as local government, education and con the construction industry. These include proactive uh, premise inspection, the source reduction and environmental cleanup campaigns in vulnerable districts, destroying dengue carrying mosquitoes in surrounding areas, fumigating, conducting spot checks, identifying mosquito larvae and taking legal action against those who fail to keep premises of houses and institutions clean. And I must say, I have had personal experience and my own house had been checked a couple of times. And, and if there were areas where there was um, you know, water collecting, people come and advised us on how to that, how we should be addressing those. So it does happen. The World Health Organization in 2016 declared Sri Lanka free from malaria. So I think that's a success for our healthcare industry. However, the risk of the spread of the disease still exists because being an island nation, we are also a recipient country of all dependent on tourism uh, and also travelers. So this is perhaps the, um, we, we can't, we need to, we can't sort of ignore the risk of malaria, even though we are, we have been declared malaria free. So we, the Ministry of Health has launched an anti-malaria 
program to increase awareness to coincide with the, the World Malaria Day and to encourage those visiting or returning from other countries to be tested and also abstain from blood donation campaigns. I think this is uh, just a knowledge sharing on my part and uh, sharing with you Sri Lanka's experience. I'm no means an expert, as I said at the beginning, but uh, I wish to commend the APPG on malaria and, and NTDs for organizing this event and encourage them to continue their good work. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, High Commissioner, for that, uh, uh, telling us about the local situation, even in your house um, in Sri Lanka. So uh, let's open this now for questions from the floor. Uh, could you, uh, have we got another mic? Well done, Martha, thank you. Uh, if you could just indicate your name and affiliation before you ask your question, sir. Hello, uh, my name's Howard. Carter, incognito, anti-mosquito. Uh, I'd like to, uh, having been to uh, Sri Lanka a number of times um, and contracted dengue, uh, not in Sri Lanka, um, but nearby, uh, I'd like to ask the, the good doctor what, uh, excuse my ignorance, what drugs are actually um, used to, to fight the dengue, as I was unaware of any. Good question, because there were some pills in one of your slides, but uh, was that just uh, optimism? optimism? Well, very good question and timely also at this point of time. Um, there is no such treatment, straightforward treatment for dengue, no pills whatsoever. What we do is uh, we admit the patients who have low blood counts, low platelet counts, and we monitor them and we replenish them with fluids. And so if they develop other complications due to dengue, there might be uh, drugs for those, there might be medication in order to support the other systems, but dengue per se, a straightforward treatment method is not available at the point of time. Sorry. Yeah, Dr. Dr. Sai. Yeah, so there are two antivirals in clinical trials. Um, it's interesting, they're being tried in human challenge studies. Uh, one is from Janssen, another from um, a small startup in Boston, uh, Athea. Um, but um, beyond the antivirals, there are, as, as Dinu mentioned, um, drugs that are, are host modifying, uh, host response modifying drugs. So with COVID, one of the first drugs that was available to ameliorate COVID was dexamethasone, a steroid. So you have something similar with dengue where some of the, um, the severe symptoms derive from host responses. So for example, um, metformin, which is a drug we associate with diabetes, has immunomodulatory effects. And there have been observational studies showing that um, metformin recipients actually have better outcomes for dengue than, than controls. And there are other a um, couple of others to mention. There's an antihistamine, actually, an over-the-counter antihistamine that's maybe being tried directly in Sri Lanka, right? And then there's an anti uh, there's an asthma drug, on Telukest, uh, which is a uh, leukotriene inhibitor. So there there are a lot of host uh, response modifying drugs that are also being uh, trialed besides the direct acting antivirals. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ranjan Ramasamy from uh, partly from Sri Lanka as well. What I'd like to what I'd like to do is to make a comment based on my experience in malaria and dengue and vector-borne diseases, is that there is a disconnect, it seems, for whatever reason, between science and the people and, and the administration of dengue or, or vector control programs, which needs to be addressed. For example, um, we showed within the last two years that um, during COVID-19 lockdown restrictions, the incidence of dengue in Sri Lanka dropped very drastically by 80%. And this was uh, supported by work done by uh, Gatsari Malavige and De Silva and so on. 
But what we went on to show with limited data was that this was due to the lack of feeding on EDC Egypti, lack of feeding off EDC Egypti on people while they were moving about. Which I think the message there is that you, one needs to target places like bus stations and schools, which obviously were closed during the lockdown, um, for dengue control. So you need vector biology in that sort of areas, plus numerous other things. And one additional small comment coming back to England, malaria was eradicated in the 1930s from the fens in East of England. And a couple of years ago, I was talking to a public health entomologist and he said he was the only person in southeast of England trying to detect Edis albopictus. I hope things have changed. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. We're, we're losing entomologists all over the world, actually, this gentleman. Sorry, I, my name is Graham Matthews. I'm at Imperial College, although I retired uh, about 20 years ago, but I'm still active. Um, I want to come back to the question of the control of the vector, the mosquitoes. When I visited Thailand many, many years ago, uh, because I was there with uh, WHO, I was shown equipment that could spray around uh, the town with a, a space spray to, to control the ED vector because it was active during the daytime. Now, I want to now go to malaria because um, I've been trying to persuade WHO that they need to consider nocturnal sprays, uh, very small droplets that go through the air and knock out the mosquitoes before they have any chance of going into a house. Because at the moment, the, the emphasis is on indoor protection. So you have bed nets and spraying inside the houses. But there's been nothing done about the change in human population. Because in the 1960s, they probably didn't go out uh, late after, after the sunset. But I saw one particular article from Benin, and it talked about the 7 p.m. to the 10 p.m. population, because they are going out shopping, and they're going out uh, seeing friends. And the amount of outdoor transmission there has increased because they've not taken any impact on the actual vector because it's all very well expecting people to be indoors under their uh, bed net, but um, a lot of biting can occur outside. And I was, uh, one of the trials I did in uh, Cameroon included uh, bed nets, indoor spraying, both together, and also treatment, spraying around the vegetation of the house, so that if a mosquito landed there before it went into the house, it was probably killed. So space spraying or on the outside of the house is just as important. But if people in towns are going through the villages and uh, shopping areas and so on, you need um, space spraying probably in the modern future will be with a drone rather than aircraft. And uh, the thing is that it's a, a crucial development that's got to take place, I think. Thank you very much. We have an online question, I think, first. Marianne, do we? Could you read the question? Yeah, sure. So first of all, uh, opportunity to say a big hello to our online audience uh, tuning in from uh, Brazil, Uganda. We've got uh, colleagues in Saudi Arabia and also a big hello to everyone in Bangkok at the moment, flying the dengue flag out there at the ADS. Um, so a quick question here from Andre Capizuto, who kind of building on your um, comment, uh, Dr. Matthews, and also perhaps uh, for Dr. Sosse, who's online, um, Andre was asking about sustainable technologies, in addition to the visits that uh, you were talking about, Your Excellency, um, what sustainable technologies to control adult mosquitoes are available, or perhaps what might we be looking towards uh, in terms of recommendations? 
And I don't know who'd like to take that question first, or perhaps if Dr. Sose is, uh, can answer that uh, online as well. Was it partly directed at Dr. Sose? There was no specific uh, kind of direction. But... Anybody pick that one up? Um, sorry, uh, so a uh, small excuse first for Richard Allen. He couldn't come for personal reasons. So my name is Sergio, I'm representing here and just uh, not directly replying to the question, but somehow replying. I think we saw uh, a huge amount of challenges and not that many solutions that can effectively, effectively, effectively be used tomorrow, I would say. Uh, and that range from vector control to uh, case management, so treatment. So yes, it's, it's a big challenge. I think uh, we are now really waking up for for the threat of arboviral diseases and the threat that it uh, that it um, poses to 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 Europe um, yeah just uh, I was listening to to the presentations and just a reminder that there has been an outbreak in Europe back in 2012 in my home country in Portugal in fact it is in the island so ecologically quite different but as we know climate change and uh, the change I mean, I could see it today in London, how the weather is changing. Um, and obviously these mosquitoes adapt. So my, my main comment is also leveraging from your comment. Thanks for that. Um, I think dengue control, and we had a great example from, from the high commission commissioner, um, st vector control for dengue still rely on old technologies. Um, so what we do in Mentor also to give you uh, kind of a, a feedback on that is is rely on those technologies and they work as they work in Sri Lanka it's mainly larval source management um, and other vector control tools that really help reducing transmission but there's a dire need for innovation there's a dire need for new tools uh, to come on board and rapidly respond to adapting mosquitoes that adapt quite fast to this changing environment we see uh, Aedes were always um, urban uh, mosquitoes, uh, but we see Anopheles adapting to urban contexts as well. So how do we look at strategies that can tackle both at the same time uh, with the differences they have, of course. Um, I think the research and development call, it's it's valid for new new drugs, new therapies, but also for for vector control tools and i think there's there's really a need to 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 call for further partnerships that were raised by dr soche in, in the first presentation to really bring the private sector and all the technology that exists at the moment uh to really speed up the control because it's a matter of time i think it's not a if it's coming it's i think it's a matter of time thank you yeah, I'd like to add a little bit of that. Um, since we have been dealing with vector control and vector control only for the for the past so many years, we try actually to aim on the uh, adult mosquitoes and the larvae. So uh, when it comes to adult mosquitoes, as you clearly mentioned, we do uh, we try to identify the times that the mosquitoes are more active, which when which it gets in dengue, it's 5 a.m. in the morning to 7 a.m. in the morning, and in the evening for five to seven. So in Sri Lankan setting, that is the time where everyone comes back home and gets outside, drink a little bit of tea, you know, uh, breathe a little bit of air, and that's where they all get it. So why, what we try to aim is uh, to catch the adult mosquitoes, our spray teams, our, uh, what you mentioned was mist fogging, we call it, uh, where we there's a diesel-based one, a petroleum-based uh, spray and a water-based spray. So there has been a lot of debate about these spraying because uh, it, it's fumigation after all, and it comes with a whole lot of other aspects and other health conditions. But uh, as of right now, that is what we have and that is what we use. And uh, in Sri Lanka, especially in the city of Colombo where I work, we have teams going uh, around clustered houses where they have had cases where we start uh, fogging and misting these areas. And yes, the bed nets are also there, especially in hospitals. If I, I couldn't get a, a proper picture, but we have hospitals with different bed nets for each bed so that one does not transmit to the other. So yes, vector control, uh, and yes, we do look at schools, uh, especially Buddhist temples where there are statues where water can segregate. And you know, uh, the thing is, 
being in a in a country and an endemic country who has been suffering with dengue we have with the strategies we have almost done it all and yes as you said we need new tools for vector control management and uh, after all as i mentioned before 25% of our uh, annual health budget in colombo goes for dengue and out of that is at least about 12% goes for chemicals and chemicals that are used to control the parasites the larvae and the mosquitoes so it is a huge amount and even though uh, every time we understand the monsoons we understand the characters and we even try to uh, co correlate it with the temperatures and if there are te temperature increases we know that rains are coming uh, we go into minute details as if it is a massive rain we are not afraid of dengue if it's like slight drizzle where you can you know have water segregating everywhere we we anticipate an outbreak so uh, everything has been done in order to anticipate and fight for it including vector control in a city like uh, Sri Lanka, but we need more tools. We need more vector control management tools and research and development, even though whatever, however we manage the vector, uh, the cases seem to be increasing and new diagnostic tools and treatment method is, methods are absolutely vital at this point of time. Thanks. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Sai would like to make a comment. Um, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, so um, vector uh, managing Aedes aegypti is really difficult, um, but it can be done. Um, uh, Singapore and Cuba are two countries that have been very successful. Uh, but the problem is sustainability. How do you sustain these programs over decades? And um, there are very promising, it's a very exciting time actually for control of Aedes aegypti. There are several promising modalities emerging. And then beyond that, there's a, a methodological uh, uh, sea change in the way entomologists are viewing studies of, of uh, Aedes aegypti control. Previously, studies had as their endpoints reductions in Aedes aegypti prevalence. When the real goal is to measure reductions of dengue in people. So what's happened now is increasingly trials are being done with that epidemiological endpoint, reduction of human cases, using cluster randomized trial uh, designs. So that um, makes an enormous difference because now you can interpret that result with uh, some public health uh, implications. The new modalities that are emerging, I, I can just mention several that are I think pretty exciting, maybe you've heard of some of them. Uh, one is the use of a rickettsia called Wolbachia pipientis. This is an endosibiont. Uh, it's not, a, uh, not usually a natural infection of Aedes aegypti, although it infects 60% of other insects. But when introduced to Aedes aegypti artificially, you have a stable infected line of Wolbachia infected Aedes aegypti. Those mosquitoes are resistant to transmitting yellow fever, dengue, Zika virus, chikungunya. That's one important feature. The second important feature is that when you introduce those mosquitoes into a field population, the matings result uh, in an un uneven distribution so that the field population is entirely replaced by a Wolbachia infected population after a relatively short period of time. So this introgression of a Wolbachia infected Aedes aegypti can just replace the entire population with a uh, Wolbachia infected population that cannot transmit or has reduced capacity to transmit these viruses. So there's been one cluster randomized trial of this technique in Indonesia, which showed very promising results. I can't remember the numbers, but in the 80% range for reduction of dengue cases. Um, and uh, there are trials underway in a number of different countries in Brazil. Um, it, it, this is a, a project um, being undertaken by an NGO called the World Mosquito Program. Um, the other interesting uh, way to use Wolbachia is uh, something called the incompatible insect technique. So for years in agriculture, releasing sterile males has been used to reduce, to crash the population of a pest uh, insect. 
It works very well. It, typically, the males are irradiated enough to make them sterile, but not too much so that they're not fit you know, out in the field. So um, there's a, another approach to using to sterilize these males using double-stranded RNA plus a chemical ster um, mutant mutagen mutagenic drug, thiotepa. So two trials in Brazil have shown 90 plus re reductions in dengue incidents with release of these mosquitoes. Uh, in Singapore, there's another um, technique where they use Wolbachia well, infected mosquitoes that also are sterilized to try to ensure that only males survive. They did not want to replace their population with a Wolbachia infected population. They were afraid that that might happen. They wanted to be sure to release only males so that they could crash the uh, Egypti population. And that observational trials, again, that in the range of high 70, 80% reductions in dengue cases. Um, then just one last one, uh, sorry, uh, uh, spatial repellent. So many of you are familiar with uh, mosquito coils, if you light them and they fumes uh, keep the mosquitoes away. There is uh, something called, um, there are um, uh, little plastic hangers that are being hung in houses that uh, not only repel mosquitoes, but also uh, can kill them. And uh, a, a randomized control trial in Peru show, uh, excuse me, Ecuador showed that uh, there was a 35% um, reduction in dengue cases. And another, that trial is being extended to Sri Lanka, in fact, right? So um, these are really, oh, if I say one more, there's a, there's a, yeah, there's a residual uh, indoor spray technique. So you only have to spray even once at the beginning of the season indoors, and, and that actually has, has shown in one trial 95% reduction in dengue risk. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Soshi, can I bring you in? Uh, you'd like to comment, I believe, would you? Thank, thank you very much. Yeah, just to comment on sustainable vector control. So listening to colleagues, you, have, you can see that there are a lot of research going on, but what we need on our side is to make sure that we have a clear pathway through the R&D blueprint to connect you know, researchers with uh, people working on development and uh, um, procurement to make sure that this product can be, can be available, assessed and approved to be used at country level and at local level. And uh, that's why I was saying in our meeting the last two days that R&D is really a missing piece, a missing pillar of the neglected tropical disease program. But we already have the R&D blueprint for epidemics, making sure that we work together to accelerate research and development, but also up to the implementation to fill the existing gap will be important. At the same time, we need to make sure that we also work with the other sector. When you talk about health in all, all sectors, to make sure that environmental management will be critical in, in vector control and everything we do in urban planning to make sure that we don't create the condition for you know, mosquito breeding site to continue you know, entertaining this level of transmission. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Soshi. A very quick comment. For, no, you're all right. A quick uh, last question, please, because time is advancing. Have you, could you, sorry, use a mic for people who are remotely? I'd bet. I'd better use my indoor voice then. Um, Richard Hopkins from the Natural Resources Institute, uh, an insect behavioralist. And one of the things that I would like to comment on is that there is a paucity of knowledge of how mosquitoes move within a landscape. And this is very important because to, to start an outbreak, a mosquito has to move from somewhere to somewhere. And the spatial dynamics isn't understood for many of these. I did some work together with Swedish colleagues, and we were able to show that with malaria, the people on the edges of communities were terribly exposed to both the biting and the disease, and this was there. But also I would like to comment on sterile male release, which does have many big challenges. Um, the clues in the name for the wild males, they're keen and they're mean. 
the individuals who are raised for release are rather more lackadaisical often. They're smaller, weaker, and a colleague of mine described they'd rather have a fag and a glass of red wine than go looking for action. So th the fact that you have them very much outnumbered by the wild males who are keener and meaner adds massive challenges to getting sterile release done because there are a lot more of them and they're a lot keener. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very quickly, Juan. Very quickly. I, I promise. Thank you. So I just want to wrap up in the sense of one of the areas also that we need to keep focus on is around the research and development, the contributions and the agreements between private and public sector, meaning investment perspective. And I think that's also something especially uh, needed, especially for the industry, not only from a vaccine company or pharma company, government, EPI, and so forth, but there has to be that further collaboration, grants, and so forth to continue to explore new tools that we need to bring to, to, to the people who need it most. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I need to round up now. I think time is, is, is beaten us, but this is a truly uh, emerging disease of colossal proportions. The statistics are very frightening. Half a million global cases in 2000 and just 20 years later, well over 5 million. Um, and, and we've heard that the potential risks, not only in endemic countries in warmer climates, but much closer to home. Um, so I'm very grateful. I must uh, acknowledge uh, the support and thank, and thank Marianne Compare and, and Cameron Rafik of the International Society of Neglected Tropical Diseases for their excellent organization of this uh, meeting and, and uh, securing uh, the speakers. Uh, I'd like to thank Martha Varney of, of our APPG uh, for terrific administrative health as well. Thank you very much, Dr. Soshi, um, for joining us. Um, and I hope you were able to follow up the whole meeting. I know it can be difficult remotely, but it's lovely to get your contributions and appreciate your time. Particularly grateful for Your Excellency, the High Commissioner, for coming and giving us the local flavor. So if we can round off by giving a round of applause to all our excellent panelists. Thank you very much indeed. So uh, I think we have to vacate the room probably as well by, do we? Six? Maybe another event. Oh, there is tea and coffee next door. So, right. Thank you very much.